I think one of the very first things that strikes you is that all of a sudden you're in charge. Um, um, you may well very be a middle manager in the States, and all of a sudden you go there and you find yourself really in charge, and there's, there's very little transition to that. And there's questions from the employees and questions from back home that come very quickly about things. Your exposure and level of responsibility is simply going to be uh, both broader and greater uh, than perhaps your counterparts in the United States. You don't have the the large support group of a home office or the large support group of a government agency, if that's what you're working with, you're really, you're pretty much your own boss. It may be stressful. Any international assignment may be. In, in a tough or difficult situation, we would automatically put forward what we consider to be our best behavior. And we may have the best of intentions. This may not always be appropriate when we're dealing with a foreign culture. Good to see you again, Kahit. Please, please. You're looking well. How's Mrs. Sowen? She's good, Oh, uh, no, thanks. Really, I'm trying to come down. Well, here's the problem. We've got this uh, shipment of supplies that came in for the hospital. Now, if we can get them moved to the building site today, we should be able to stay on schedule. As you can see, though, it's getting pretty tight. I just found out today that uh, these supplies have been sitting on the dock for a week. Uh, <laughs> they're just sitting there. They say we don't have the necessary paperwork. That's the problem. Yes, well... I'm sure it's just a simple misunderstanding that can be very easily cleared up. Uh, Mr. Wilson, this is most unfortunate. I'm in a bit of a crisis here. I mean, we've really got to act fast on this one. Today's Wednesday. Uh, tomorrow and Friday, nobody works here. Uh, and then you've got... Uh, Ramadan coming up, and the way I hear it, things really slow down for a month. Hello? Abu Faisal? Dagiga. Abu Faisal, telephone. Gul and Kalmo Harik. Basically, uh, I was hoping you could rush a permit through today. I mean, after all, this is a project that's important to your people, it's your hospital. Mr. Wilson, my people have been living for many years without the hospital. We can wait two more weeks. There's no problem. The Saudi in this scene speaks English rather well and undoubtedly is used to foreigners. However, the real point here is that when you can do things the way that illustrates your appreciation and understanding of the way they think sh things should be done, you're gaining a great advantage. For a friend, I might have been able to help. But the American's behavior was very insulting. He first inquires about my wife. You're looking well. How's Mrs. Saud? He then refuses the coffee that I give him in hospitality. Well, I'm sure he shows me the soul of his foot, and to add insult to injury, he hands me papers with his left hand. Well, as you can see, things are getting pretty tight. The man was in a great rush. He had papers written all over. 
We have a saying that a man who wants to see into the future is either insane or irreligious. What good is a plan if God decrees otherwise? There are some really basic tenets of their religion that you should learn before you go to a to an area where religion is very important. A lot of people, um, particularly I think uh, in America, um, ask the question, why do we really have to go to all that trouble to learn another culture uh, when, in fact, our way of doing things and the Western way of business and uh, technology has spread around the world and people to work with us and work for us should learn our ways. To a degree, they are learning our ways, no doubt about it. But to work well with them, to have them work well with us, to get the best from the possibilities, to reach that full potential, we have to know where cultural differences are, are causing great barriers. If the person is able to establish and maintain a personal relationship with the host national, that will determine more than anything else that person's success. Many of our projects overseas now are transfer of technology. I can have all kinds of knowledge in my head, and I can have skill that I've learned over 20 years, but if I don't have this rapport, this relationship with this host national, it will not be transferred. We get very used to people in the States taking responsibility, defining the task, setting the objectives, and then that person goes off and does it. And if they have difficulty or have some questions about it, they'll come back and ask you that. Uh, in Hong Kong, that doesn't happen at all. Um, if people don't understand what the responsibility is or they don't understand what the objective is, they just go off and do nothing. And it's very difficult to get, get used to that. Uh, the other side of that, of course, then, is that after you discover that that's happening, you can't go to that person and um, uh, reprimand them uh, in a very severe fashion because then that would cause the person to lose face. In India, for example, the role of the manager is to make decisions. He's paid to make decisions. He is respected because he has the ability to make decisions. The employee role is to carry out the decisions made by the manager, not to question them, not to come up with suggestions that might improve a managerial decision, because his role is to please his supervisor or his manager. Hi, hello, sir. I've just been uh, looking around, and uh, I've noticed that uh, most of the key punches aren't too busy. Uh, so I'm hoping you might uh, help me out. And I sent up some orders for uh, compilations, but really my department uh, could use them tonight. So I was wondering, uh, since things look kind of slow down here, if uh, maybe you could reschedule my work. Uh, you know, maybe move it up a bit. What a question. In his position, he should know tomorrow's payroll has priority. It would be insolent to even answer such a question. I should involve him in this decision. Get him to accept some responsibility. Um, well, is there anything running right now that uh, maybe you could shift to a lower priority? Or, uh, or maybe you could have someone uh, keep punch my job during lunch? Why is he insisting on asking me this? He's my superior. He's paid to make decisions, not me. Whatever you say, sir. He's refusing to accept responsibility. Well, it's your department. Uh, I'm sure you're the best judge of what could be done. I'd better tell him what he wants to hear. Very well, sir. I'll reschedule your work as priority. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Raj, what happened? I beg your pardon, sir? You promised you'd have my compilations by the end of the day. I've, I had all my people in my department are expecting them, but they're still not in. I'm very sorry, sir. These Indians can't get anything done. This American is too immature to be a manager. 
Why should I cooperate with him? There's nothing inherently natural or written in stone about the way bosses or subordinates are to act. Just because in your country, bosses act one way and subordinates act another, doesn't mean that those are the ways that people around the world are going to act in similar jobs or relationships. Every country has a heritage that has shaped the social system, the roles and the status that people understand. And when modern business comes along or other kinds of organizational forms that are modern come along, they are grafted onto those traditional social understandings. All organizations have some functions in common, but how they perform those functions can differ greatly. British cost accounting may be radically different from American. This can easily cause some confusion as to the meaning of financial statements. Mrs. Russell. Hi, Doug. This is some weather you're having here. Yeah, this is ghastly, isn't it? Please. Would you like some tea? Oh, yes, that would be terrific. Thanks. As I recall, you take sugar but no milk. Is that correct? That's right. Well, this certainly is a pleasant surprise. What brings you here at this time of year? Evidently, you didn't get my letter. I wrote it over a week ago. I just came to take a look at your books. The books, why? Because Strategic Planning is putting together its market projections for the USA and the rest of the world. But there seems to be a question with your profit picture. It's time for the planning team to make a hard analysis. It seems to me that our performance has been quite respectable. Look, Doug, I like you, so I'm going to be honest with you. If it turns out that your operation isn't meeting their projections, it looks like they're going to transfer control to Chicago. Do you think maybe we could take out the books and see what the situation is? I'm afraid I have an appointment scheduled for this morning already. Well, can't you postpone it? This is pretty urgent. We could arrange another meeting. Monday, perhaps? Doug. It is true that Americans speak English, but Mrs. Russell and I were certainly not talking the same language this morning. She was rude and undiplomatic. Imagine arriving here without a previous appointment and then expecting me to rearrange my schedule at a moment's notice and then going on about the USA and the rest of the world. The rest of the world, indeed. If she speaks to the rest of my staff in that manner, she'll get no special cooperation from this office, I can assure you. In international business, a lot of very crucial information is embedded in foreign subsidiaries or joint ventures or other customer companies, client companies, where it's difficult to extract that information unless you know how people provide information in those countries. Just because you know what you want doesn't mean you can walk right in and ask direct questions and get the kind of information you need. You have to have a strategy of how to extricate, how to mine information, or, uh, and that strategy has to work uh, country by country. Mrs. Russell. In some places, building rapport, putting yourself somewhat at the mercy of other people, or being much less direct, is the way to find out what is really going on. Well, this is a most pleasant surprise. What brings you here at this time of year? I'm having difficulty understanding your financial reports. You know, your cost accounting is done so differently from ours. Help me out if someone could show me your system. Of course. I'll speak to my secretary about it straight away. Keep always in mind that the two realities, the one of the home office and the one of the local situation, are both real and you should keep in touch with both of them. Don't hide out in the local scene or just in the American community. Always be listening to two points of view because your job is to seek the best combination, that which will work to achieve results on the scene for your company. Dealing with headquarters can be very difficult because uh, often you're dealing with people who don't understand, who haven't lived overseas, who haven't been involved in the local environment and um, think that you're going native on them or think that you're you don't understand or you're you're not responding the way you ought to respond and trying to explain that to people back home is very hard I think the main way to to make them aware that this is Japan is simply to invite them over I'm extremely sympathetic right now to the the international assignments that I deal with because I've been on those international assignments 
I know what their problems are. What really can give you the competitive edge over price and service, which a lot of people are trying to give, uh, is actually getting over there and actually seeing these people. But you're not going to get very far if you do it only by mail or by phone. You have to get over there. You have to go over often. You've got to repeat the trips and show these buyers that you are serious about working with them and for them and developing a personality compatibility with them. What one country or one people expects on the interpersonal side in business dealings can be very different than what another uh, country or people expect. There's a question of phasing often between how quickly you build rapport as individuals and how quickly you get down to brass tacks in talking business. In some places, your trustworthiness, your character, and generally your personality needs to be appreciated and understood before uh, people feel ready to talk business. In other places, just the reverse. It's only after you've talked business that you relax and become uh, friends or acquaintances. In Mexico, the personal relationship comes first, and then business will go smooth. Hey, mi hermano, ¿qué tal, hombre? ¿Cómo estás? Mucho gusto. ¿Qué te trae? Qué encantado de saludarte, señor. Es un placer. Cuánto gusto. ¿Y los niños cómo están? Muy bien, gracias. En el colegio. Buen provecho. Mr. Thompson. Sorry, I'm a little late. Yeah, for a while I thought maybe I had the wrong cafe. Uh, <laughs> you haven't ordered anything yet. No. Oh, let me get you some beautiful brandy. Ah, Armando, Armando, por favor, dos copas de brandy añejo, presidente. Por favor, ah, huh? gracias. Sit down, please. <laughs> Is your family traveling with you? No, not this time, I'm afraid. Ah, that's too bad. Imagine traveling to a foreign country without loved ones. Can be a long experience. Don't you agree? Oh, I travel a lot. You know, I sometimes even forget what my wife looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I've been spending so much time promoting this new line of equipment that we've got, though. Uh -huh. I'd like to talk to you about that new system. Tell me, have you seen any of the local size yet? No. Oh, the architecture here is so beautiful, magnificent. I like to, to think that it reflects our Spanish heritage. Also, our Mexican identity, too. Uh -huh. Must be beautiful. Oh, for instance, our national cathedral was built in the 16th century during the colonial time. I would love to take you there a little later this afternoon, if you like. Thanks, but I think I better pass. Uh, you see, this is really a business trip for me, and I wanted to talk to you about the advantages of that new <laughs> system. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, we have a saying that is, uno trabaja para vivir. Uno no vive para trabajar. What it means is, uh, one works to live. One does not live to work. One could never let business interfere with your enjoyment. Our is a truly magnificent city, rich with history. No, it, it is a wonderful city. Beautiful. And I really look forward to doing business here. A new catalog. I think you'll be impressed by our improved equipment. Uh -huh. It is the most advanced in the world and at a very reasonable price. Here like we this. have the brandy I was talking to you about. See? This is the most beautiful brandy in the world. Salud. A su salud. That means to your health, Mr. Thompson. Salud. <laughs> salud, salud. <clears throat> now, let me show you something. This is our new Model 723. Oh, yeah, and I'd like to... Now, we're trying to compare the kind of work we did last year with... Uh, I, I've got some figures for you. The American was getting a lot of signals from Mr. Herrera about Mr. Herrera's expectations. Mr. Herrera was pointing out that there was a wonderful cathedral that he wanted you to see. It was uh, something he was proud of that was representative of his culture. And by paying attention to that and getting excited about it with him, uh, chances are that great strides could be made toward the final negotiation much faster than pushing the contract at him. This man, Thompson, he wasn't there talking to me. He was only talking to himself. He was talking 
to his catalog, the sales, sales and catalogs. That's all. No, I will never think for a moment to sign that contract. No way, Mr. Thompson. That's not the way to do business in Mexico or in Latin America. <laughs> Salud. You have to have a lot of patience, and you have to be prepared for things to take a lot longer than you'd normally expect them to happen. And you have to have uh, almost a broad perspective on things. Um, you have to have very good connections. If you're going to make that kind of a trip, you have to have very good connections, and, and your people in those places have to have things have to have things well set up and well organized for you. There's probably more methodical pace in European negotiations, and once you get accustomed to that fact, it's very easy to adapt to. Uh, but you do have to take into account that people are not going to come to a meeting with the expectation necessarily of reaching a conclusion. It may be that. This is only a preliminary meeting. You need to set an agenda for your next meeting, and the next meeting will reach tentative preliminary conclusions and so on. And once you accept the fact that the decision-making process is going to be somewhat more elongated than what you may be accustomed to here, you can phase your timing to match it just fine. If anyone coming from the United States or another Western country is simply sensitive to the people, starting with the assumption that they're different and that what makes them tick and what satisfies them is not going to be the same thing that satisfies you and is sensitive to that and can pick up on facial expressions, body language, participation, motivation. Um, you don't need to be fluent in language to understand uh, that perhaps you have to modify your style. The key to motivating uh, a person in another culture might not be money, it might not be a big raise or a big new position. It's more often that what motivates is the ability to be an effective member in a team. It's the interdependencies and the harmony that's required for efficient group work in Japan. Everybody is involved in the decision-making process and surprises are avoided. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, excuse me. Uh, before we break this up, I'd, I'd like to make an announcement. Uh, I hope you'll excuse me for speaking in English, but as most of you know, my Japanese isn't very good. You all know Tommy Wakayama. I'm sure you all like and respect him as much as I do. Well, since I arrived here a month and a half ago, I've been very aware of Tommy's fine performance in every aspect of his job. Tommy's the kind of worker we like to see back at headquarters. He's a real go-getter. But more than that, he has the ability to function creatively, to use his own intelligence and initiative. Therefore, it's with great pride that I'm announcing the creation of a brand new position, chief of our marketing group, and promoting to that position the man I feel is best qualified. Stand up, Tommy. Let me be the first to shake your hand. Congratulations. Keep up the good work. Thank you, John Stan. Since I promoted uh, Wakayama, the, the group's production has gone right through the floor. I mean, he, he seemed like the obvious choice, but uh, did I choose the wrong guy? Or? Well, Jonathan, it is difficult. 
I know you ad admire Wakayama-san very much. But here in this country, we have an old saying which goes, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Wakayama-san is too young for this promotion. We believe in the spirit of cooperation and uh, harmony, what we call why in Japanese. And this promotion just disturbed the harmony. You could have talked with me. That's I'm here for, you know? I understand what you said. Well, I think you just, you learn. You make mistakes. And if you're lucky, you have someone on your staff who understands foreigners and who will sort of call you off to the side and explain to you that uh, you just did that the wrong way. It does help a great deal to find somebody who can kind of be like a coach or a mentor, someone who can guide you through the intricacies of giving a talk to the employees or uh, selling the product or just finding a place to live. You want, therefore, to locate one or maybe two or three people to whom you can give a great deal of trust and who will be open with you about the mistakes you're making. I certainly had in the American community a number of sounding boards, mentors, people I could go to and uh, be briefed, uh, brought up to speed on local matters, and I found that invaluable. But that's part of the networking I think we all do, whether here or abroad. I know I've always been asked, well, why, why do I have to do the adapting? Why can't they adapt to me? One thing that's very important to remember is that when we're working in France or Saudi Arabia or Japan or wherever, with someone who has learned English, he's already gone more than halfway to adapt to you. He knows about you because he sees American television, he sees American movies, he reads American books, he reads Time Magazine or Newsweek or the International Herald Tribune. He knows about America. We have to learn about him. We have to go at least halfway. There's no overestimating the importance of learning the host national's way of doing business. Because if we blunder in with the assumption that there's one best system, there's one best way, and we've been doing it that way for 15 years, we're almost sure to fail. So the key that will work, I think, in any culture is to go in with an open, receptive mind to hearing and learning about how business is done, how each managerial function is performed in this particular society and being open to working with it that way, even if it's different from what you're accustomed to.